Let's all stand and turn to 167. 167. Say good evening. Certainly good to see you tonight. And good to be in the Lord's house. And uh, that's a, a good song to, a good resolve, isn't it? Working till Jesus comes. We're in the book of Judges tonight, chapter 7. And want to look at uh, Gideon and uh, think about that somewhat. I was trying to think in uh, maybe a message I'd preached. I can't remember. I'm sure I've tried to preach on Gideon before, but uh, the Lord helped me see some things that I uh, that I know I've not uh, preached from that uh, thinking before, and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 part of the Bible, uh, the book of Judges. You know, God, of course, was leading the, the, the nation of Israel uh, through Judges for that period of time. And then the last verse in the book of Judges, I believe, said every man did that was right with his own eyes. That was a bad time, wasn't it? But uh, God really used Gideon, and we want to look at that tonight. Uh, we'll take some prayer requests. I mean, appreciate the prayer tonight. I appreciate you being here in the book of uh, Judges. We'll read some verses there, and uh, trust the Lord to help us. I first had uh, the verses from one uh, set of verses, and then I've moved it to... Uh, uh, the seventh chapter, and we'll be mentioning some other things. My title of the message tonight is Mighty Man of Valor, Gideon. And, you know, whenever the Lord, angel of the Lord, appeared to him, that's how he addressed him and called him Mighty Man of Valor. And uh, from what I'm understanding of Gideon and his circumstance and situation, that was quite a shock to him. He couldn't imagine himself a Mighty Man of Valor. But uh, when God gets in it, uh, he, and he did use Gideon in that aspect, and uh, as the story unfolds and as the events happen. In the book, in the seventh chapter, and we'll try to read verses 15 through 18, and uh, trust the Lord to help us there. In verse 15, and it said, It was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof uh, that he worshipped. 
and he returned into the host of Israel. And he said, Arise, the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, uh, so shall you do. And when I blow the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow you the trumpets also every, every side of the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you again. Privilege of being in the Lord's house for salvation. I pray the message may you just impress on my heart uh, with conviction and, and earnestness and anointing of the Holy Spirit of God to go forth the Word of God and may it find a resonating place in our hearts. And may it speak to hearts. And Lord, for someone who uh, will uh, view and listen to this message boy, may, by way of video that don't know the Lord, I pray they'd be saved for Christ's sake. Lord, these needs been mentioned tonight, we pray. Lord, you'd help and, and be with situations. May we be mindful, uh, even after we leave the service, to be prayerful and have it on our hearts and approach the throne of grace in their behalf. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to think a little bit. Give me that about Christians either overcome. Uh, Christians are either overcome uh, because of their unbelief or we're overcomers uh, because of our faith. Uh, we either overcome by unbelief or we're overcomers because of our faith, Christians, their faith. Now, I'm thinking tonight about, uh, in, in relation to that, of Gideon and, of course, the faith that he had. And his name, of course, ends up in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 in the uh, Hall of Fame of, of the Heroes of Faith, and Gideon's one of them. Uh, I was thinking, I want to give this first little outline. I read this, and some may have, uh, about Abraham, uh, some may have uh, heard uh, uh, or read messages, maybe heard uh, quotes and different things. Vance Habner, and uh, we can be proud in North Carolina that he was from North Carolina, and he was a great country preacher. I might term it that way. And uh, a lot of people quote things, and he said a lot of things that stuck with a lot of people. But I was reading uh, uh, Warren Wisby was talking about being, uh, he was the, uh, at uh, Moody Church in Chicago, and he said, uh, in, uh, I believe in, the, in a school there, but he went to, he's talking about their chapel meetings, and they had a lot of people come in and preach in the chapel meetings, uh, but he said Vance Haber came on one occasion, and he said, I don't remember uh, a lot of the sermons, but he said, I've always remembered this one that he preached, and he preached on the faith of Abraham, and he said that Abraham was able to see the invisible. We read that in the book of Hebrews, that he saw that was invisible. Uh, he was able to endure because he saw him who was invisible. And he chose the imperishable, and he was able to do the impossible. Uh, I thought about that. He chose the imperishable, things that won't perish. I uh, was thinking about a, a, what Jim Elliott, he was a, a missionary that lost his life on the mission field. And uh, some may have heard as she carried on his wife Elizabeth Elliot, a lot of uh, good things that she did and said. But he, uh, there's several quotes about Jim Elliot, and I'd pulled it up and looked at it. But one of the, his most uh, rememberable quotes, I guess, that I've heard several times, was he said this, that a man is, is not a fool uh, to give up the things that he cannot keep to gain the things that he cannot lose. Uh, that's a good thing uh, of life, to think about life and, and view that. A man is not a fool to give up the things that he cannot keep. To gain the things, praise God, that he cannot lose. And Jesus said it somewhat this way, if a person will lose their life for my sake, they'll find it. But if they find their life, then they'll lose it. Uh, same principle in thinking. So we're thinking about faith tonight. And thinking about Gideon, and I'll say just a little bit about Gideon from the outset and, and thinking, and perhaps myself included, you know, sometimes we hear sermons and we read commentaries and we hear 
different thoughts and people expressing their opinion about uh, different things. And there are those that uh, would be critical of Gideon, and uh, rightfully so in thinking perhaps uh, that uh, I read one commentary and the, and the writer seemed to think that Gideon was nothing but a coward. And, uh, but uh, we can read, see the circumstance and uh, we could be uh, a lot more sympathetic toward Gideon in uh, the things that, the actions that he took. And where we first find Gideon and the, and the angel of the Lord found Gideon was down our threshing wheat in a place to where he was at the wine press, it says, and he was there at that particular place trying to hide from the Midianites. And uh, he had every reason to try to hide from the Midianites because they had just, uh, uh, I don't know what the word, ravished or whatever they'd done and intimidated and, and, uh, and abused the nation of Israel there for seven long years. And the, the, the circumstances that was just, it was an impossible situation as far as man's concerned. And uh, in fact, we read about, you know, whenever Gideon started out, he had 32,000 uh, people. And you know the story, how we'll talk about that some. And then it got reduced to 22, I believe. And then it got reduced to 300. So it went way down. But if he had kept the 32,000, uh, that was not much of an advantage against the Midianites when they had 135,000. So the numbers was, was way uh, not even to be compared to, uh, to begin with for 32,000. So we can see Gideon uh, had reason to be fearful and he had reason to want to be sure that the Lord was going to be with him. And there again, we'll talk about the fleece and the, and the dew and what Gideon did. You're familiar with that. And there again, I've heard sermons, I believe, and said, you know, that uh, you, you ought not to question God and, you know, te testing the Lord and all that. But then if we put ourselves in that place, uh, I, I believe I'd have stayed hid if I could uh, down there uh, just threshing wheat and hid from the Midianites. And the Midianites were nomad people. They just uh, moved, you know. And uh, we see that in the book of Judges of some other people. And uh, they were that type of people. But there were, they were lots of them. In fact, there were so many of them, they, they referred to it in comparison to just like a bunch of grasshoppers as ever were. And so they were. But I was thinking about Gideon, you know, maybe the criticism that we would point toward Gideon. And uh, I thought about something. Give me that remember. And uh, this is something to keep in mind always in our thinking toward anyone and others, remember that the best of men are still men at their best. The best of men, they're still only men at their best. And I want to thank God tonight, Psalms 103 and verse 14, that the Lord uh, remember us and know of our frame and he remembers that we're dust. One of our memory verses, that's Psalm 136, verse 23, who remember us in our low state for the mercy of the Lord endure forever. Now I want to look and think, we're thinking about Gideon and the best of men are still men at their best to keep in mind in relation to everybody. And so it was with Gideon. Now I want to notice uh, some things about Gideon here and the, the verses that I read tonight and of course, uh, going back to his first encounter whenever the angel of the Lord appeared to him there and, and, uh, and, and Gideon said this about himself. He was the tribe of Manasseh. And there weren't too many th things noteworthy about the tribe of Manasseh. And he said that he was the least in his father's house. <laughs> and Gideon, more or less, he said, I'm a nobody of a nobody's where I'm at. And that's, uh, he, you know, sometimes we, say that. I've had that said to me uh, by way of encouragement, said, well, uh, look at it this way. The only way you've got to go is up. I had my uncle tell me that one time. <laughs> and so that's where Gideon was, at least of the least. And I, I can relate to that for sure. Uh, and, uh, but uh, then he, he began to, at my first point tonight, is worship and warring. And the two of them are inseparable. Worship and warring. 
And what Gideon did at the very initial at the start was that he, he tore down the altars of Baal and destroyed the groves. They had groves to, to false idols. And I don't know all that was connected with the idol worship. But the first thing he did was destroy that. And then he built an altar and revived the worship of Jehovah. And the point being tonight is in any work, warring or any service for the Lord, uh, the, the starting place is in our worship. And it just is common logic spiritually that if we're going to do anything for the Lord, then the first starting point is getting right with God. And so Gideon did that, the worship. He got the worship right, right off. Now the verses that I read here in verse 15, and I will tell the story of the dream, the interpretation, but it says there that whenever he heard that, that he worshiped. And worship was always the priority to start with, with uh, Gideon, he understood that principle. And if the worship's not right, then the warring cannot be right at all. And so the worship and the warring are inseparable. They go together and they must both be right for it to come out right. And so it was in Gideon's case. Now, and then of course he put the fleece out. And there's just a multitude of messages in this, uh, in these verses to be thought about. Is he put the fleece out, you know, and he asked God, to uh, let, uh, let the dew fall on the fleece the first time and it to be wet and the ground around it to be dry. Well, the next morning, sure enough, the fleece was wet. And you say, how wet was it? He wrung out a whole bowl of water out of it. And uh, just to prove it was wet, amen. And so then, then he, 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 he went to the Lord again. And uh, he was just wanting to be sure uh, that the Lord was with him. And that's the whole key tonight is the Lord being with us. And so he went to the Lord again and he asked him then, said, I want you to let the fleece be dry and I want the ground around it to be wet. And of course, you know the story the next morning, that was the way it was. The fleece was dry, the ground around it was wet, the dew. And uh, there's a message within the dew itself. And it's interesting to note in the Bible that dew is symbolic of the, of the benevolent goodness of God and the power of God in respect to His goodness. And dew is spoken of in a verse, a favorable sense in the Bible. There's a message within the dew itself. And uh, God puts it all in there and works it all out and all the pieces fit together. And that's the thrill of study is to see something. And so it is with, with the dew. Now, and of course, then here, our verses we read in verse 15 is the verses prior to that, and we'll read them tonight in th verse 13 of this chapter 7. And when Gideon was come, behold, there, there was a man that told unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And a little cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and he came unto a tent. And he smote it that it fell and overturned, and the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joshua, a man of Israel. For unto his hand hath God delivered Midian and all of his host. Now that's an exciting two verses. Now what's taking place here, after Gideon had, he put the fleece out, and then God, and that's my second point, I think if I've got it right, is the wonderful providence of God. And I always marvel and get thrilled at the providence of God. In the book of Esther, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that the, that the word God is not mentioned in all the book of Esther. But you say, what do you see in the book of Esther? You see God all over the place. You say, where do you see? You see the providence of God. You know, Haman, of course, you know the story of that. You know, he, he was going to, he built the gallows to hang Mordecai on. But uh, the providence of God changed the whole thing around. And we see as the story unfolds there, Esther was in the right place at the right time and God just worked all this and, and the, the different things was heard. You know, Mordecai sitting outside the gate and uh, he heard somebody talking about uh, an overthrow of the king and... Uh, so he told that to the king and uh, they, uh, 
they got it in the Chronicles there, and one night the king cut and sleep, and so he read that about, uh, you know, the overthrow, and he said, well, who was this? Who's the, uh, we call it the whistleblower now. He said, who was this man? He said, has anybody honored him for this? And he had old Haman out there <laughs> riding him <laughs> in the chariot honoring him. Boy, that, I mean, Haman, you know, that just run him crazy, you know, so... Uh, but anyway, you say, what do you see all that unfolding? I see the providence of God. And we won't praise God tonight. Each one of us could stand and testify tonight that God had us in a certain place at a certain time, maybe on occasion to speak to a certain person, and God was working the whole plan. And it was His hand. We couldn't see it to begin with, but then we reflect back on it and say, so, so God was in it all, all the time. He's working this here. You can see the whole picture. And so we see in this the wonderful providence of God. And you say, what do you see that excites you about that? Well, here's, here's Gideon and one of his servants. And it just so happened. Isn't that amazing? It just so happened that they go and they're close enough to the Midianite camp to where they hear two Midianites talking. And one of them is telling the other one about a dream that he's had. And so Gideon and his servant there are overhearing the whole thing. Well, wasn't it something that God had given uh, a Midianite a dream? And it just so happened that Gideon and his servant was there at this particular time, and they were close enough nearby to where they could hear the conversation, and he's telling his fellow Midianite about it. Now, it's interesting in the Bible about dreams. Uh we see a lot of people or several people in the Bible had dreams. Uh, several believers had dreams. Of course, uh, uh, we see that uh, Jacob had a dream. Joseph had a dream. Daniel had a dream. Uh, other people in the Bible uh, had dreams. Solomon. And then in the New Testament, you remember at the virgin birth of our Savior, Joseph, God spoke to him in a dream. And then we see something else interesting in the Bible, and uh, this fits in with our verses about uh, the Midianites here talking that they had the dream. But also in the Bible, there's unbelievers that had dreams that come from God. Abimelech was one of them, had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream. And then over in the New Testament, uh, we see that uh, Pilate's wife had a dream and was spoke to in a dream. Unbelievers had dreams. Whenever Joseph was down there in prison, some of his fellow prisoners had a dream. You remember that? And, and Joseph interpreted it for him. The, the, what was it? The butler and the baker. And one of them was going to be restored to his position. And the other was going to lose his head. And they had a dream, you know. Unbelievers had dreams. So it was in the Midianites here, these two Midianites, uh, one of them, unbelievers, one of them had a dream. And in that dream, he began to tell it to his fellow uh, Midianite. And he said this, and Joseph, uh, Gideon had already had the fleece out, and you know, the two experiences with that, to get uh, confidence and assurance that God was going to be with him. But it's interesting to me that now in this place, in the verses I read, Gideon gets reassurance and encouragement from an unbeliever and from the adversary. You see the providence of God in that, the hand of God. Isn't it amazing what God does and he can do anything, amen? That's a blessing, isn't it? And there's nothing too hard for him. So he's putting the whole thing together for Gideon. And this is what takes place. And they say this. This is interesting what they said. They said, we had a dream. And it said it was a barley cake that rolled into a tent. And you say, whenever you read that and thought about that, what did that do for you? Well, it kind of helped me just, you have to keep that up there. It kind of helped me a little bit in some of the wild, crazy dreams I've had. And that sounds a little bit, I mean, a barley cake rolls into a tent and knocks it down. Uh, can you visualize that? That's just a little bit, ain't it? 
it's, it's, it's kind of, I, and that, I don't know that that explains any of the crazy dreams I have, but I've had some of them. And I've not dreamed of the barley cake yet, but maybe the nine will be the nine. Sometimes Beverly will wake me up, and sometimes I say, I won't thank you for waking me up. I, I wanted to get out of that dream anyway, you know. Uh, thank God. But the barley cake, and he said, I dreamed a dream, a little barley cake tumbled, and the host of Midian, it came into a tent, unto a tent. And it smote it and it fell and overturned the tent lay alone. And then he went ahead and said this, and this give Gideon the assurance. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon and the man of Israel. For unto his hand God delivered Midian and all the host. Now here's two Midianites talking. He talked about the dream he had and God gave him a dream. You said, why did he do that? He wanted Gideon to hear it and he wanted to reassure him. You said, what did it do for Gideon? He had done a whole lot for him. The first verse that I read, the first verses that I read and we see it again in chapter 15. After Gideon heard this, he's put the fleece out and he's had the experiences with that and God's come through both times and the Lord's with you. And then it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, and the interpretation thereof, number one, he worshiped. You say, what are you thinking, preacher? I'm thinking when God does anything and God speaks to us and God gives any assurance, you say, what do you all do the first thing, preacher? You ought to worship God and thank Him for it. Amen? And that's the principle involved. Gideon worshiped. And then not only that, and he returned unto the host of Israel and he said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered. Gideon said, This is it. This is the confidence. This is what I'm waiting on. This nailed it down. God's in it. God's delivered the Midianites into our hand. You're talking about some faith and some courage. Begin to build in Gideon. He's come a long ways from down there hiding out from the Midianites thinking he's the least in the family and he's of the little tribe of Manasseh and it's insignificant anyway. And not only is his family, the whole family is insignificant and he's the least one of the family. But God begins to move. And Gideon begins to believe and his faith is built in God. Now, what God's looking for is I tried to study this. There's some verses, and I didn't get them, but then 1 Corinthians, and you, you're familiar with them. I'll just mention a little bit about it, and I never went and reread them. But uh, it talks about God never chose many that were noble. He chose the foolish things of the world, and found the wise. You're familiar with all that. And I, I was reading, and you know, whenever we begin to depend on our talent and our ability and our education, and all of our talent and, and skill and all this that we maybe depend on, get away from God, then God leaves all that and you say, what well, he does, he goes and looks for a Gideon somewhere. And he went ahead and said this to, to Gideon. You remember that? He's talking about had 32,000. And that was the first thing the Lord said. He said, oh, that's way too many. And the reason that's too many is if they win the battle, they're going to say that they did it with their own hand. And God said, we're going to get it down to the place where that whenever it happens, they can't nobody stand back but say, God did it. And you know, I was thinking about that. Sometimes in our life, we wonder what's happening. And God may be just getting us in a place that whenever we're going to, whenever he works and uses us and works through us and all, that we can't do a thing in the world but stand back and say, I'll tell you one thing, God did it. He wants us to understand, know that. He got Gideon in that place. And he said, 32,000 too many. And all them that's uh, afraid, let them leave. And 22,000 of them took off right off the bat, you know. And then God said, well, that's, that's still too many. And I want you to take them down there to the creek, uh, the Reddish River. <laughs> and I want you to get them down there and I want you to, let them get a drink of water and we're going to send them on down. And whenever they got down there, some of them, whenever they're drinking water, they got down on their knees, I guess you'd say, if you can picture it. And so they're burying their head in the water drinking. But the 300 that he chose, you said, what'd they do? They scooped up the water in their hands and left it like a dog. That's how they drunk the water. And you say, why did they do it? They had the eyes on the Midianites. 
they weren't too concerned about drinking the water right then. They, had, they were already determined and dedicated. And their goal and mission was, we're going, we're going to defeat the Midianites. Those people were ready, the 300. So you've got, you've got it down to where the 300, they, they're not, they've already committed. And what their mission is now we're going to defeat the Midianites because they had been convinced and no doubt Gideon went over it with them 300 and told them, said, I put a fleece out one night. Let me tell you what happened. The dew fell on it. I reversed it the next night and I was asking God if he's in this and he came through again. And then not only that, just the other night I was over there and I got close enough to the camp and I heard two of our enemies talking and God had given one of them a dream and one of them was telling the other one about it and Gideon no doubt had told all them 300 that and boy, they was pumped up and primed up. They said, we know for sure God's in it. They were ready, those 300. Faith builder, amen. You know, it's always exciting to get around somebody and boy, they're, I like to get around somebody just wide open for the Lord and they just got Jesus all over them and, they, and you, you know praise God it, it's a faith builder you know you, you want to go with somebody like that they're convinced these 300 and so Jacob said or Joseph, uh, Gideon said and I'm getting my people mixed up I'm about as bad as preacher Ivan Dameron the blind Barnabas up the sycamore tree and we may get that done Clyde Balk said the first time he ever preached he was excited he said that uh, he f- it felt like God was working, dealing with him to preach. And he said his pastor, he must have sensed it too. And so he asked him, he said, Clyde uh, said, I'm going to be away on Sunday night and I want you to fill in. He said, you think you can do it? And Clyde said, I believe I can. And he said, he did. He's so excited about Sunday night and hardly wait. Clyde Box said, he got up there and preached. He preached on Samson. And he said he had saps in the fire furnace and he had him in the lion's den. But he said he preached. He said he started home. Told his wife, said, praise God, I know what God wants me to do the rest of my life. God's called me to preach. And she said, well, I hope you do better than you did tonight. She said, I don't know if a thing you said was right. (laughs) So anyway, we're back to Gideon. And whoever else we got fighting the Midianites. And we see Gideon. My third point is the winning strategy. Now here's a man that uh, he's not a mighty man of valor, but God's been working and God's been moving and he's, he's believing God. That's where faith comes in. He ended up in the hall in the heroes of faith, chapter eleven. He said, "We're not we're not going to forget about Gideon." You can read the verses there in the book of Hebrews, and it begins to mention other people. And Gideon's one of them. He believed God. He said, "God has delivered into my hand the Midianites. We're going to win this thing." Then we go back and we look at it. They're like grasshoppers everywhere. We've only got three hundred men. But praise God, he had a winning strategy. And this is what he did, and you know the story. He took the 300, and he gave them all a trumpet. And whenever a trumpet blowed, it was a war trumpet. It was a symbol of war. And he gave them all the trumpet, and then the pitchers, and then he had the lamps, the torches, some had said. And they're, they're in this, uh, they're concealed in the, probably a clay pot, whatever it was. And he said, now, and Gideon said this, he said, now I want you to watch me and I want you to do what I do. And of course he took and blowed that trumpet. And he split the, the 300 up in companies of 100 and spaced them out. And so there he did. It's night time. And now if you can picture this, the Midianites wake up out of a dead sleep. And all of a sudden they hear trumpets blowing. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like one more noise. And all I'm blowing in unison, whenever he blowed, they blowed. And he said, then I want you to break that uh, uh, pot there, the pitcher, and then the torch, the lamp's going to shine forth the light. Gideon's wake out of a dead sleep. 
You ever woke up just out of a sleep? I mean, I know Beverly's done that to me before. Uh, used to have one with Deacon Maranath, and he'd call me. He drove a truck. Sometime he'd get in later at night, and he'd call me. I didn't mind him calling me, but and sometime I'd be asleep. And she'd just wake me up and hand me the phone. And so I asked him one night, or one day after talking to him on occasion like this, I said, did I confess anything to you? <laughs> I mean, I was afraid of what I might have told him. He said, no. <laughs> he, I don't know whether you tell me the truth or not. But, he, but anyway, now if you think you're ready to talk on the phone, you're dead asleep and you just wake up and somebody then it took years. So you can imagine the Midianites down there dead asleep and all of a sudden they wake up and trumpets blowing. And they're looking around. There's light everywhere. And it so confused them till chaos, a riot broke out. And they were grabbing the swords and slinging them every which way and they're killing each other and it's just, uh, it beats anything you've ever seen. So they, and then they decide the best way to do, we better get out of here. I mean, you know, we're, we're surrounded. We, they've they've uh, encompassed us and, and the whole thing, it, it was, it looked a lot bigger than what it was. But it's night time. <laughs> God knows how to do it, don't he? You know, that's about like Cicero, whenever he, in the book of Judges, he, uh, uh, for 20 years, he oppressed the children of Israel. And they had 900 chariots of iron, I believe it was. And so they were, you know, that, that was quite a force. And Barak, you remember the story back about that, and they scared to death of the, and uh, Cicero, the captain of the host, and, and all this oppression, had 900 chariots of iron, and all those horses, and here they come. And the children of Israel, they wasn't ready nor equipped nor uh, couldn't handle something like that. But you know what God did? He just opened up the windows of heaven and just a washout. And the horses and chariots got stuck in the mud. <laughs> what a simple solution that God can come up with. Ain't that a blessing? You know, we're sitting back and said, who in the world would ever have thought of that? A God that created the whole universe can think of that. Very easy and simple. He, he can just stop anybody in their tracks that he wants to. In fact, I read in the book of Psalms that he does whatever he wants to. Preacher Michael, somebody asked him one time, said, Preacher, where did God come from? And Preacher Michael said, anywhere he wants to, he's God. <laughs> so he, there, and, and then the children of Israel will begin to go and uh, take the spoils. I mean, they just... You know, they're getting all kinds of things from the Midianites. They took off. They defeated them. And there never was a problem to them again. The Midianites, they, they finished them off. What a great battle. And I believe for 40 years they enjoyed peace under Gideon. I'm not sure I think that's right. For a long period of time. But the next thing that took place, and that's in chapter 8, verse 22 and 23, and that's my fourth point, is the wisdom that was displayed. Now, you can kind of uh, figure out that whenever all this happened, Gideon, the, he's the leader, and men there took away with Gideon. And so the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thy and thy son, thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I'll not rule over you, uh, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. We see wisdom displayed. Gideon. You know, we said, well, they're ready to put him in as king. You know, later Israel gets a king. They wanted the king. They weren't satisfied the way God was doing things. And, you know, then the first king didn't work out good. And you know that story too. But, but the, here it is, Gideon. Well, who wouldn't be tempted to grab a hold of that opportunity? Said, we want you, we're going to put you in. Not only that, uh, you, your sons is going to come in after you, and then your grandsons, you know. And Gideon said, no, that's, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to do that. I read a story, Pete and I, we love to read after uh, Spurgeon. If he's not read it, then I read it, and we tell each other all that, but anyway, and we'll never read all he wrote because I got volumes of books that he got more sermons in print than anybody's ever lived because they put it in print back in them days. But I read about uh, Charles Spurgeon 
Back in the 1800s, P.T. Barnum, that had uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus, and I read too, and I believe he died in 1891, I'm not sure, but anyway, he was living in, in that time frame of uh, Charles Spurgeon. So he, uh, he, uh, he talked to Charles Spurgeon, and he asked him to come to America, and he said, I'll put up a huge tent, and I'll get you to speak. And I will give you a thousand dollars for every time. What B.T. Barnum had thought though was he's gonna charge admission, of course, put up the big tent, and the thousand's going to Spurgeon, and then he's gonna keep the rest on. He's a businessman. And I asked Pete, and we're trying to speculate, and some of you may figure that out. What would a thousand dollars be nowadays? If it was thousand and eighteen hundred, you talking about a sizable amount of money he was offering Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon wrote him back, and he gave him this verse, Acts thirteen ten, and he said, "Oh, full of subtility and all mischief, thy child of the devil, thine enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord?" Charles Spurgeon sent him back that verse, Acts 13, 10. And said, that's my answer. I ain't having nothing to do with that. Well, Gideon was kind of in the same thinking. Charles Spurgeon, a man of integrity, wasn't he? And, and he wasn't going to be involved in that. And Gideon said, I'm not going to rule over you. But here's something interesting in the Bible, and we know that that in the Word of God, that it don't just tell the good parts of people, but it tells the negative side. Put up there again, men at their best. Remember, best of men are still men at their best. And we're still all made from the dust. And he remembers our frame and for the Lord remembered us in our lowest state, and for the mercy of the Lord endure forever. Now it's interesting to note in life, the wisdom was displayed with Gideon there. And then my last point tonight is his wrong decision. And we we'll go on and we see that in our verses, if I can find them. And he said that in verse 23, chapter 8, and 24, is that where he's talking about ruling over us? Thou hast delivered us from the hand of the Midians. And Gideon said unto him, I'll not rule over you, and neither my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And then he goes on in verse 24. And it's interesting to note tonight that on the hills of grace is Gaul. And on the hills of goodness is evil. And it's always to be remembered tonight, as God does about us and remembers our frame that we're just dust. And Gideon made a right decision and seemed like in the next breath, he's making a wrong decision. And you say, you critical of Gideon? Not by no means. I don't know where I'd have been. I believe I'd have stayed down there at the wine press threshing of wheat and just hid and said, you just go on and work with somebody else on this. I mean, those men and I say they're like grasshoppers and there ain't no way. Ain't no way. Gideon's had great victory. But there's always a caution tonight whenever victory comes. And defeat can be close by hand. You remember the fellow that came to Jesus and he said, if thou canst do anything for my son. And Jesus said, if you'll believe. And he said, I believe. And then he said, Lord, help thou my unbelief. You know, there's a verse somewhere and I should have looked it up. And the Bible says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. 
And I'm reminded again of a sermon that I heard somebody preach a while back from this pulpit, and it was me, and I preached on the strength of the Lord, and it's not my strength, but it's His. And it's always not my strength, but it's His. And the arm of flesh will fail us, and the arm of flesh has failed me, and it's not my strength, but it's His. And when I'm dependent on His strength, then we can see wisdom displayed. But Gideon did this in the next verse. And Gideon said unto him, I, uh, unto them, I desire one request of you, that you'll give me every man the earrings of the prey, and for that the golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered and said, we'll give them to you. And he spread a garment and did great therein every man earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested, a thousand seven hundred shekels of gold, and beside the ornaments and the collar, purple raiment, that was on the kings of Media, and beside the chains that were about the camel's necks. So he gets all this. Then Gideon goes down there, and he makes an ephod. And an ephod was... Uh, and just leave that up there if you want to. And that's the verse I want to look at, verse 27. And Gideon made the ephod thereof and put it in his own city and, uh, and Israel. And they went whoring after it and the thing. And the, king, the thing became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Gideon made an ephod. An ephod was uh, kind of a breast like... Uh, jacket type thing that uh, in every way we could understand I guess but what the priest wore and you remember on the priest ephod it had the different uh, things on it and, and uh, uh, Gideon had made this now he wasn't going to accept ruling over them but he made this and the thought was Gideon's uh, into an area where he ought not to be this was Aaron and his sons that was the priesthood lineage the Levites not Gideon. So he's intervening in the spiritual aspect of the nation of Israel. And what did it do? It became a snare to his house. Gideon. So we see the wrong decision. And I don't know why he thought about that and doing all that. And they had took all this spoil from the Midianites. They had golden earrings. They had garments and all this stuff. They just went down there and, and uh, just helped themselves to the, uh, the whole thing. Yeah, but they was willing, they gave it, and so he took that gold and, and, he, and he went ahead and did this thing, and it was a snare to him. The wrong decision. There's always a danger when the victory comes, and you better be looking at it. You say, why is that? Because we've got an adversary. And the faith that we can exercise to where we can be overcomers, on the other side of that coin, the unbelief is where we can be overcome. You say, what do you think you ought to do? Well, I think we ought to just try to stay focused as Hebrews chapter 12 said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And as Vince Habner preached a message about Abraham, that he was able to see the invisible. And he chose the impersonable, and he was able to do the impossible through faith. You said, does that take away from your thought about Gideon? No, it just reminds me again that Gideon was just a man. You know, you ever thought about when we preach about Elijah and praise God, that's the exciting message in Mount Carmel. I, I just love to preach that just for the fun of it. That's a blessing. But in the book of James, we read where it said Elijah was a like man of like passion like we are, just a man. But a man in the hand of God and God with him can do great things like Gideon did. But a man in unbelief and the wrong direction can do things that are wrong in our own efforts, in our own mind, our own thinking, our own reasoning. You know, many times human reasoning and logic ain't a thing in the world but an enemy to faith. Somebody said, don't try to figure it out, just faith it out, just believe God. Amen. And that's not always easy to do, is it? 
I heard Charles uh, Stanley say that one time in a particular incident of his life, and I've heard him, I believe, more than one time refer to that, and I don't know what it was, but what was taking place. But he said God was telling him one thing, and he said all the circumstances around him was telling him something else. And he said, the Lord spoke to him, said, Charles, are you going to believe everything you're seeing and the circumstance, or are you going to believe me? Because you said, what can happen? All of a sudden, God can change all the circumstances. He can have two Midian nights, one of them dream a dream, and one of them tell the other one. Who in the world would have ever thought of something like that happening? It's amazing, isn't it? You say, what do you think? I think we're serving an amazing God. And it gets exciting in the Christian life. You say, what's God up to next? That's a good place to get, ain't it? Well, I thank God. And I was excited about studying this. You know, the Lord, I, I like again what Preacher Parker said. He said that is something in, in summer in preparation. And you begin to pray and seek the Lord. And begin to study. And you begin to sense that there's somebody else here. And the Lord begins to speak. And you say, well, all those things just happened. No, no, no. I was going up 268 many years ago, and I was going there to the Heart of Brothers Sawmill, and I'm in that oil truck, and I'm, I fix, I'm giving my signal, fixing turn left off 268, and the Lord said, preach Sunday on prepare to meet thy God. I'm going down the hall where we used to live down there one day on a Tuesday I believe it was and the Lord said preach Sunday on Proverbs 29 and verse 1 and then I began to read and so I'm reading from the book of Daniel one time on a Saturday and I'm down at the church when I was there at Maranatha in the office there I'm reading and the Lord impressed me and said, read the book of Daniel, 12th chapter. So I was reading along. And I was reading about where the interpretation of the dream and the king got all his wise men, magicians in there and he said, uh, you know, won't you interpret the dream? And they said, all right, what was the dream? And he said, I forgot it, I can't remember. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, ain't nobody can do that said, you've asked a rare thing, R-A-R-R-A-R-E, -R -R -E, rare. Only time it's used in the Bible, one time rare, in Daniel 3 and 11, I believe it is. Only one time. And God said, I want you to preach on rare tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, what am I going to say about it? <laughs> and then he come and help me and give me a message. God's good, ain't he? I'll praise him tonight. Amen. And it always thrills me, preacher, and I know it does, preacher Chris, when the Lord speaks to me. Well, the songwriter got it right, didn't he? Whenever they said, Who am I that a king would come and die for? Who am I that he would say, Not my will, thine for? I'm down there by the threshing wine press at the threshing place hiding from the Midianites. Scared to death. But God's good. <laughs> and we've got a big God. Amen. He can use us. Let's stand tonight and pray. I wonder why we're standing here. His bowed and eyes closed for prayer. I know on my heart by uplifted hand there's some burdens and some things. Our Heavenly Father we lift our hands toward heaven tonight in the service, the special request that we mentioned for Sister Barbara, and we pray, and Brother John there, and we pray for Loretta and the family, Nick, the loss of their loved one. Pray you to help. Then we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace that you've bestowed upon us, been so good. And Lord, other various needs and sundry needs, and Lord, I pray you'd forgive me. The, we're sinned against you in the failures. And I want to thank you tonight that you remember our frame that we just dust. And Lord, man, it is best. 
and the best of men, he's still man. Lord, thank you for salvation, your mercy. Message goes forth. For those that are lost, they're hearing the message. I pray that help them to understand of being lost, number one, without God and without his son. But help them to understand that Jesus went to the cross of Calvary and bore their sins in his own body on the tree. And he died for our sins according to the scripture. And praise God, the third day he rose again. And they can believe that from the heart and be saved and go to heaven. And I pray it happened for them. The greatest thing could ever happen and has ever happened to anyone is salvation through the Lord Jesus. Again, we pray for the needs you'd help. And thank you for tonight and our time together in Christ's name. Amen.